roll call to order the December 6, 2021 meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board, our last meeting in 2021. It is remote on Zoom. <clears throat> Meetings normally held at our municipal offices are being held remotely in this situation with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. MGL chapter 30A section 20 meetings are typically broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television. I am assuming that will be the case. And um, all the meeting uh, entrance codes and special Handshakes are on the uh, DeerfieldMA.us uh, website. So I will call the meeting to order with a reminder. We always say this, but it's good not to necessarily scoot over it too quickly that, that we, are, we do want to speak one at a time, follow the Deerfield Code of Conduct to be respectful, considerate, and courteous, um, concise, non-repetitive, and recognized by the chair. So identifying um, board members in attendance. Rachel is not in attendance. Denise Mason? Denise Mason here. And Mary Clear? See, I don't see a Mary yet. Okay, well, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> Kathy Watroba? Kathy Watroba here. Kathy Sylvester? Kathy Sylvester here. Andrea Liebson? Andrea Liebson here. And Annalie Wolfkull here. So um, we still do have a quorum. So we are happy to <clears throat> call the meeting to order with our quorum. Um, we are still pending our minutes from um, November, the 1st and the 15th. So um, <laughs> Rachel will have an opportunity to do that from her sick bed. <clears throat> and um, thank you to Sue, who is listening to this now tomorrow um, for um, drafting our minutes for us tonight. So we'll just scoot right ahead here to our new business with um, a very warm welcome to Alyssa LaRose and Peggy Sloan. Um, as mentioned on the agenda, Alyssa is the FERCOG Regional, Regional Housing Coordinator and um, Peggy is the Director of Planning and Development. Um, we all, as a little bit of just slight background, we did start last fall sort of brainstorming a number of um, initiatives that the planning board might be able to take on our own. And um, a lot of those initiatives did have to do with housing. And so tonight we've asked Alyssa and Peggy to be with us to talk in particular about um, background really with some of the housing initiatives that they've worked with with Deerfield because in fact FERCOG has worked with Deerfield on a number of initiatives um, and then also um, uh, tell, let us know to some degree what's going on in other towns and then have a discussion. I know we have some members of the community who also are interested in this conversation also. So Peggy and Alyssa will let you take it away. Great, thanks for having us. Yes. Um, if I could, um, I wanted to share my screen and just walk you through. Um, we will spend most of the time on housing and some of the other areas that the planning department, but I just wanted to give you a brief overview of the planning department in case there are other issues that can't come up. Um, so I'm going to see if I can share my screen. And hopefully. Thank you. All right. Everybody see that okay? Yes? Okay, great. So um, I understand Linda Dunlavey came and talked to you in general about the Council of Governments. Um, for those that might have missed that presentation, uh, we serve the 26 communities in Franklin County and basically offer services that many of our small towns um, can't afford on their own. And we do a lot of grant writing to bring um, funding to the region and the towns. So the planning department um, focuses on a number of areas, housing, economic development, land use and natural resources, transportation. We have a, uh, do a fair amount of uh, geographic information system analysis and mapping. That's the computerized mapping. And emergency preparedness is also part of the planning department. So I'm going to turn things over to um, Alyssa, 
who um, will be walking you through the housing uh, planning work that we do. And I should note that sadly, sadly. <laughs> Alyssa has um, left the Council of Governments, but she's staying in the region. She's gonna be working for the Regional Housing and Redevelopment Authority and RDI and putting all, those, all that planning work into practice and uh, creating new affordable housing for the region. So <laughs> she um, graciously agreed to help me out tonight because she's sort of our housing expert um, to talk about um, housing planning. So Alyssa, thanks for coming and I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thanks, Peggy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so actually today was my first day at um the regional housing authority so um i'm just fresh off of my planning <laughs> planning um world at FERCOG. but the kind of overview that i'm going to give to all of you um, um is kind of a, a history of what we've already looked at um and done in in deerfield um and then this is all work that so FERCOG currently has, um, is, is hiring to replace my position um, as well as another um, planning position. And so this is work that the FERCOG can help you with, you know, moving forward. Um, so um, in terms of a housing plan, there's some different options that towns can do. Um, the housing production plan is kind of the, the most official um, version and probably most comprehensive. It's um approved by the state by the department of housing and community development um and so it can get you um some extra points on some grant applications i believe if you have an approved housing production plan um and it's a five-year plan and it identifies the housing needs in your community and it does have a specific focus on affordable housing as defined under chapter 40b of um, the state law, um, which is housing that has a restriction on it for a certain amount of years and is either rented or sold to households earning at or below 80% of area median income. And we won't get into all that detail right now, but that's kind of the, the specific um, definition um, when you're talking about um, affordable housing at the state level. Um, and so Deerfield actually did a housing production plan and i'll get into that in the next slide um <clears throat> but towns also can do kind of more um um just kind of do a housing needs assessment um as well as maybe a public survey to gain insight into what the housing needs are in the community and this this is part of what a housing production plan has but without having to do maybe the full scope um, and can still provide really um, important information about um, demographics of the community, your housing stock, um, how affordable is your housing for the folks who are already living in the region or working in the region. Um, and so it's a really helpful tool. Um, and then some of the implementation activities that might come out of these types of planning activities um, or kind of planning studies are things like looking at um, your zoning and does your zoning support the type of housing that your community wants and needs. So there may be some changes identified. Um, Deerfield has Community Preservation Act funds and so that's a really key local funding source that can help support um, housing, both housing programs as well as affordable housing development in your community. So looking at you know how might those funds be targeted to meet your needs um uh, another option for communities is setting up a municipal affordable housing trust um the towns of leverett and waitley both have housing trusts that they've set up these are um municipal bodies that um can um kind of pool local funding for housing purposes and, and oftentimes CPA is a main funding source for that, but it doesn't have to be the only one. Um, and it allows for some more flexibility in terms of using CPA funds without necessarily having to go to town meeting um, if it's being used in a way that the town has agreed to. Um, and then of course, looking at possible sites for affordable housing. So Peggy, you can go to the next slide. 
So as I mentioned, and I think all of you are aware, Deerfield um, completed a housing production plan back in 2014. So in terms of its official status, it's expired. Doesn't mean that it's not useful to still take a look at. Um, but if the town wanted to update it in the future, um, you could start with the 2014 plan and kind of update the information that's in it and resubmit it to the state to get um, to have it be kind of an official approved plan. Um, so back in 2014, that planning process identified some key needs, including the need for affordable rental housing. And I did put some um, up-to-date statistics because I think the needs identified in 2014 are still present and if anything are probably even more the case. Um, so right now, um, it's estimated that about 44% of renters pay too much for housing in Deerfield. And actually, the large um, portion of those renters are actually paying more than half of their income on housing, which means they're extremely cost burdened. Um, these are estimates, so um, there's definitely a margin of error, but it's um, the best information we have. Um, and we also know that Deerfield's been producing less and less rental housing over time. So your amount of rental housing is kind of going down. Um, um, the plan also identified affordable home ownership housing, um, which uh, I think, you know, Deerfield is a, a desirable place to live. And so the prices kind of reflect that. Um, but especially right now, we know prices are high everywhere. Um, there's just not a lot of supply out there and demand, um, you know, the supply and demand is way off. So the prices are really high. And this is the current year to date median sale price in Deerfield through, um, I believe it's through October 2021. Um, and so this is um, a, a sale price of 391, um, 500 is is pretty out of reach for most kind of median income um, earners in the region. Um, so that's a pretty big gap um, there. And then affordable senior housing was identified as a need. And we know this continues to be a need in the region as our population ages and as the baby boom generation ages. Um, and so there, that continues to be a need. Um, so some of the zoning strategies that had been identified in the plan, and when I, I went back and reviewed, I reviewed the strategies and I looked at your current zoning and it, it looks like um, they're still pretty relevant. Um, I don't think that there were changes that impacted um, these specific strategies since 2014, um, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. I know you did work on accessory dwelling units last year. Um, but that I believe those changes didn't um, pass a town meeting. Um, so some of those recommendations had to do with kind of removing some of the restrictions that you have on accessory dwelling units because it is um, pretty restrictive right now and kind of hard to enforce because it's really um, geared towards, um, you know, requiring that it's a family member or a caregiver who lives in the accessory dwelling unit as opposed to you know, it could, you could just be renting it to someone and that's okay. Um, but right now, the way you have your bylaw written, that's not allowed. And then um, also looking at allowing for detached accessory dwelling units by special permit um, and maybe allowing accessible uh, ADUs like within a structure by right or within an existing home by right. Um, we, uh, in the previous plan, it had talked about allowing two family homes um, uh, in the rural agricultural district. Um, and there was also recommendations about removing the additional minimum lot size that's required um, in, especially in the CVRD district, which is where you have water and sewer. You currently require additional square footage when you're putting in a two family home um, or a three family home. Um, but when you have water and sewer, you don't necessarily need that additional space. Um, you may need to have a larger lot size because you also have things like setbacks and um, you have a, um, 
maximum lot coverage requirements and things like that. So the, the lot size may still need to be larger, but you don't have to require it to be larger because you could fit a two family home on the same lot size as a single family home when you have water and sewer. Um, so kind of not, not making it even harder to do a two family or a three family when you have the infrastructure there. Um, and then we also talked um, in that plan about your definition for multifamily structures is you currently limit it to three units in a structure. Um, and that really makes it hard to do. Um, you know, I know one of the things that the, the town is interested in is senior housing. And it, if you can only put three units in a structure, even an existing, you know, historic structure, um, it's gonna be hard to, to make that work. Um, and so, changing that definition to make it possible to have more than three units in a structure um, going forward, at least um, in areas where you want to see that type of development. Um, and then there's also kind of um, the way that you allow for mixed use, it appears to be pretty limited. It's, it seems to, to be saying that you can only have one dwelling unit incidental to a commercial use um, and so you may, especially when you're looking at your village center area, consider um, having, um, you know, defining that differently so that you could have some true mixed use um, development. So, you know, talking about having uh, multifamily combined with commercial. Um, and then one of the things that we did work on with the planning board after the housing plan was looking at um, actually requiring affordable housing units in new housing development, um, which is also called inclusionary zoning. And so we, we worked with the planning board for a while on, on exploring this and, you know, had a lot of good discussions, but in the end they, did, they decided not to move forward with a bylaw. Um, but this is the type of thing where, um, for instance, if it had been in place before um, the development in South Deerfield was proposed, you may have been able to get a certain percentage of affordable units in that development because that's a larger development and would have triggered a bylaw like that. Um, but you kind of have to have it on the books um, <laughs> before a proposal is made for it to actually um, be effective. And just the other thing I noticed when I was looking at your zoning recently is um, as a kind of like a cleanup thing is removing the rate of development section, which it looks like it's already expired anyways. Um, but these types of um, regulations um, don't likely wouldn't pass muster if it was challenged. And we know it, it doesn't help in terms of applying for certain state grants to have that type of um, section in your bylaw. So as a cleanup, it kind of just makes sense to remove it. Um, do, do you want me to stop before I go on or you want me to just keep going, Peggy? <laughs> I just have a more slides. It's up to the planning board members. Do you have any questions for Alyssa on what was in your housing production plan or should we keep going? Keep going? All right. Um, so just based in terms of like what we look at in general when doing planning um, and considering what planning boards have um, kind of in your power as um, zoning, I mean zoning and other land use controls are a kind of a key implementation tool um, to implement your town's plans and your town's vision. And so you really want to look at that and see like our 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 regulations supporting what we want to see in town. Um, one of the things I worked with um, recently in Buckland um, was helping them um, amend some of their dimensional requirements in their village zoning districts to kind of be more in line with their historic development pattern and to allow for some new housing on lots that would be similar in size to what they saw in the past. Um, I think for Deerfield, this is um, this is looking at South Deerfield. Um, you mentioned being interested in 
kind of village center kind of revitalization and mixed use and things like that. And so really taking a closer look, um, and this is where like GIS um, mapping can be helpful to look at um, what are you requiring in terms of your dimensional requirements as well as your uses um, and what's there and what's possible. Right now, you know, I'm pointing out that corner lot, which used to be a gas station. I know the gas station's been removed. Um, and that lot's only about just over 9,000 square feet, but the minimum lot size in your village is 15,000 square feet. And so, you know, what's gonna happen with that lot moving forward? There may be ways to, to do something there, but it would be better if the zoning kind of matched what you'd like to see um, and allow for, you know, redevelopment over time that kind of fits in with, with your vision. Um, and so Peggy, the next slide just goes into that a little more. So um, this is a historic image, obviously, of South Deerfield Village, um, where there used to be um, buildings actually on both of those corners up to the lot lines um, on either side of that intersection there. Um, and so looking at your zoning and, and saying, well, could this be recreated today? Um, is this what you want to see today? Maybe it's not, but if it is, looking at how can you make sure that's allowed to happen? Um, making sure your lot sizes align with what's there, that you're not requiring um, kind of large front setbacks. Um, you know, you want the buildings to be closer to the street and closer to the, to the sidewalk. Um, Parking is going to be a big consideration because obviously this was <laughs> built, um, this image is from pre-cars and so that's obviously a huge thing that has to get considered. Um, but then also looking at uses and so like I was saying earlier, do you want to have housing above commercial like in the village? Because if you do, you, you have to make sure that's allowed in your zoning um, and make sure that that's um, available as an option. Um, and I think I just have one more slide, Peggy. So I just wanted to point out to one tool that's available to towns. I would say that this very much um, uh, makes sense to have this type of discussion along with the discussion of having um, a town planner, because I think some of the tools that the state provides for communities in Massachusetts are really great but they're really hard for our towns to implement because we don't have staff, we don't have planning staff. And so this is one of them where I think it could be a great tool, if, especially if you have specific sites that the town is interested in um, promoting kind of mixed income housing or even mixed use with housing as well as um, you know retail or commercial. And it can even be very site specific. So this is an example of Village Hill in Northampton um, um, but it, I would say it's definitely something that FERCOG can help the town explore more. Um, but in terms of implementing, is probably more realistic if you have planning staff who can kind of help, um, you know, move that along in the future. Um, but it's not impossible. <laughs> um, and this is just basically what, what this is, is provides a local, um, a local option for doing um, mixed income housing through your own zoning, as opposed to having to use a, a chapter 40B comprehensive permit process, which is an option um, for towns. You can do a friendly 40B. That's what um, Sunderland um, chose to go with for the project they're working on. Um, but it just means it's not, you're kind of taking a little bit of the local control out of it. Um, so this is just a tool that um, could provide for that local process, but really promote, um, you know, affordable housing as well as market rate housing. So that's, those are the housing slides. <laughs> Great. Questions for Alyssa? Lily, you had a question earlier. 
Um, yes, I, I did. Hi, sorry, I'm going to start my video. Um, can you explain, please, when there's a housing trust, mm -hmm. who owns or manages the housing and its development, and who's ultimately um, responsible? Is that typically um, an actual independent and independent state employees and things like that or is it a committee in the town or what what does that usually look like sure so a municipal housing trust it's different than a community um, land trust for instance so those are two different things the municipal trust is um, has a, a board that's um, that's uh, I think it's I think it's appointed um, and so if you have a municipal trust, they absolutely can um, be proactive in terms of seeking developers to develop housing, whether it, uh, it could be on land that's been purchased by the trust or it could be on existing town owned land or something like that. But the housing itself, once it's developed, typically would transfer to um, you know, the developer or, or a housing authority towns don't normally maintain ownership or any kind of management um, of that. That's not something most towns want to do. <laughs> um, so normally it's, it's, it may, and a lot of trusts don't ever necessarily own land. They may be involved in other activities where they're lending funding to someone like Habitat for Humanity to purchase a lot in town. And so the trust never actually is the one purchasing or owning land. So that's a way to do it. So, um, cause you had mentioned the using of CPA funds. Would it, would the housing trust exist then to take the town's committed funds and remove them from the pot and have them actually um, in a separate entity so that they're not then vulnerable to a reallocation just by being in the communal pot is that the advantage of it or? so the the main advantage is that um it allows for the trust to act um more quickly on opportunities um so cpa funds have to go through town meeting no matter what so town meeting would have to approve transferring of cpa funds to a housing trust the housing trust would then have um, established guidelines on what they're allowed to use those funds for, what type of approval they need. So oftentimes they would probably still be going to select board to get approval over a certain amount of money or to do certain things, but they wouldn't necessarily have to wait for the next town meeting to get approval to, to, to use funds. So that's probably one of the key um, benefits of having a trust is, is being able to to act um, in that capacity. Towns can certainly still use their CPA funds effectively without a trust. Um, it's just a, a tool in your toolbox. I have and more yeah. questions if nobody else does. <laughs> I have, Andrea has a question. Yeah. My question is about this housing production plan. How does one do the survey? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm involved with the open space committee and we're trying to do a survey and <laughs> it's difficult to get respondents. So I'm wondering how you, how, how that ha all occurs. And I, I guess I would say as a related thing, we're wondering with so many of these housing issues, how can we find what the residents really want? And is it through a housing production plan survey or are there other, other ways that we can really find out what residents want. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, it, in terms of um, if you're working with, so say you um, request maybe local technical assistance funds from FERCOG to do a housing study or a housing survey. And so it would be similar to the open space plan where, you know, FERCOG staff would be helping with um, creating the survey and it could be online similar to the open space survey. But then yeah, the getting responses is, um, is a struggle. And so 
we just I just helped Sunderland do a survey for their update to their housing plan and um, you know it's all the, the similar means of, of any email like town email list sending it out um, um, putting notices on the website having the select board um, talk it up at their meetings but then we also you know sent it to I mean Sunderland's different because they have the apartment complexes so we sent it to the apartment complex managers to try to get them to distribute it. Um, we posted it at bus stops and at businesses in town with the QR code. But even so, um, you know, we got a decent amount of responses, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sampling that you use to um, kind of help it, you wouldn't use the survey alone, probably, unless you can really get good responses and it's statistically significant, which is going to be hard to do. It would be in combination of looking at data. Um, and so you'd be looking at a lot of different things. You could be looking at, um, you know, census data as well as what's going on with sales. You could be looking at rents to the best of our ability. That's a little harder to collect. But, and then, adding into that the more anecdotal information from the folks who are answering the survey. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Are there questions? Lily has her hand up. Lily? Um, yeah, I was curious, you, you mentioned the, um, I'm trying, I might check my notes, I think it was like maximum of three units in a multi-family. Um, we're talking about building senior housing. Is that considered a multi-family? I, I, I don't understand. So yeah. to build senior housing, we have to do, address the specific bylaw? Yeah, so um, anything with more than um, three housing units in a structure, uh, yeah, so it would be, unless it's, like, um, and Peggy, you might be able to help me with this. If it's um, like assisted living um, or a nursing home type of facility, that would probably fall under a different use definition. That's congregate housing, so I don't know if that's a different thing, but. But if it's apartments, if it's yeah. it's affordable apartments, so what Sunderland's creating, it's um, 30 units in one structure and three units in an existing structure. Those are apartments um, for seniors. And so that's a multifamily development. That wasn't allowed under their current zoning. So they chose to do a, a comprehensive permit. Um, so what I'm saying is under your current zoning, the restriction of three units to a structure means, you know, you might have an existing building in town and say you could potentially put you know, eight units of senior apartments in it, you actually can't do that right now under your zoning. You're kind of forcing the 40B. I was going to say, so that's a 40, we could do it as a 40B. You could do it as a friendly 40B, and that's fine. That's an option. Okay, yep. thank you. Thank yep. You. We'll have Emmy next and then Carolyn. Um, yeah, I don't know if Carolyn had a response to something that was just being talked about. Um, I have a question about tiny houses. This is all like relatively new to me. Um, and if we don't want to switch gears, Carolyn can go before me. <laughs> Alyssa or um, Peggy, are we doing tiny houses later or is this a time when we could ask a question? No, we can talk about tiny houses. <laughs> go for it, Annie. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the right time for me to ask a question about it and it's just a general um, curiosity about if what the process is for legalizing them and if it's any different given that there aren't a ton of models out there for um, even having definitions for tiny houses that fit into zoning. Um, I know that you, you spoke about ADUs, you know that there are towns, you know, Greenfield has ADUs, guys, right? Um, but I'm curious what you have to say about them and if you're going to talk about them later. Um, that's great. I can wait until then as well. So do you, when you say tiny house, do you mean tiny house on wheels or do you mean just a small house or either? Either. Specifically on wheels is my interest, but mm -hmm. also either. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I can just, I can tell you what my experience has been so far working with Buckland, we kind of clarified their um, definitions. Um, and one of the things we did is, so, so they passed um, ADUs, detached ADUs um, as a special permit, um, which could allow um, what some people consider a tiny house to be built on a property, but it would have to meet state building code. And so it could not be on wheels. Um, and so basically a tiny house on wheels right now is not regulated by a code. Um, it's not regulated by the state building code. It's not regulated by the HUD code, which regulates manufactured housing. It's really considered an RV. Um, and so that's where part of the part of that comes in, where most towns allow for RVs or campers to be parked on a temporary basis. Um, so in terms of allowing them, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that has to get worked out. It would, it, some towns I think in other states have looked at like allowing almost like um, a tiny house, like campground type of a use, um, but not necessarily as permanent housing. Um, that's, that's the extent that I, <laughs> that I, that's my experience so far in, in our region is currently anything on wheels is, is not considered a dwelling unit. It's not meeting, you know, those codes. Peggy, do you want to add, <laughs> add anything? So I, I, you know, we don't have any towns that have adopted sort of a tiny house bylaw at this point. So the closest thing is the accessory dwelling units and allowing those detached. Um, so that's something that could be explored, but we don't have examples right now. Yeah, I guess the only, the closest thing would be Buckland also added a, a cottage housing um, development option that would, you know, theoretically could allow for like a tiny house um, like kind of cluster development. Um, but again, the tiny houses would still have to be, they'd be single family homes, basically. They just would be small. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Alyssa. Carolyn? Oops, you're muted, Carolyn. Nope, still, there we go. Almost. Huh. <laughs> Sorry, that's not usually my problem. Um, uh, I just want to say we are very interested in senior housing, but I think we're going to go the route of, 40, of friendly 40B because it's too complicated to have general zoning approved, you know, go through the whole process and then have housing. So I think it sounds like we're going to just going to do a friendly 40B like Sunderland did. And um, that would be the easiest. Um, and I just want to comment on tiny houses. The problem with tiny houses is the majority of our town is on septic systems. And a lot of them are older septic systems that are only two bedrooms, maybe three bedrooms. And when you put a tiny house on, that's additional bedrooms. And so it really requires an upgrade in the septic systems. And it, it's really quite complicated. So uh, I'm not trying to be discouraging of people, but um, Tiny houses have huge problems from a regulatory point of view. Do we have other questions or otherwise then we'll go forward with some more of the presentation? Okay, Peggy and Kate. So Peggy, was it okay if I jumped off at this point? Yeah, that would that's fine. Okay. Thank you so much for coming, Alyssa. Thanks, Thanks Alyssa. everyone. So I'm having, um, I need to figure out how to reduce the screen. The whole gallery popped up and I think I need to change the gallery. Uh, it's no. Up in the upper um, right-hand column, there's a little box with little boxes in it. Yeah. Do you see that? It says view, so, no? Yeah, I'm not, the view when I hit gallery, for some reason, it switched out of my presentation. So, do you need uh, to go back to your presentation? I'm uh, going to try and go back and share.
one more time. Let's see if I can get. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, so another area that the planning department um, helps towns with is economic development planning. And one of the questions that um, Annalie had sent to me was whether or not the planning board should be working on an economic development plan. And it really depends on the community. Um, you do have a DDIC and the town has also done economic development plans for the village center. And I've sent some of the copies of those plans. Um, so you can take a look at them. They're probably also on our website. But I think it's important to know that um, our economic development program manager, Jessica Atwood, is is available to uh, help towns identify business development resources. Um, and she also can do a variety of economic development planning surveys and studies. Often this is a joint effort between say the select board, some towns have economic development committees, um, other communities have um, a, an organization like DDIC. So it really depends on the community, um, but um, a lot of communities want to make sure that um, they have a mix with businesses and, and residences because it certainly helps out the tax base. Uh, if there isn't um, that mix and it relies too heavily on residential, um, that's challenging for communities. So we also do a regional economic development plan and this maintains eligibility for uh, towns in our region to access uh, EDA funds or economic development administration funds. And there's a lot of good data in here um, in each of these plans, they're produced annually. They look at the economic conditions in the region and um, looking at different local and regional projects that towns are undertaking. So we give you um, ideas uh, about things that the planning board might want to pursue, or if you're doing a master plan, things that you might want to incorporate into your master plan. So we have gotten some funding under the CARES Act. And so, for example, we funded um, some work by the Franklin County Community Development Corp, the CDC, to provide uh, business technical assistance directly to businesses in the region. Um, and we're also doing a Franklin County water and sewer infrastructure um, plan. This is really important. Um, many of the existing systems uh, need to figure out how to prioritize investments and capital improvements. Um, some of our village centers don't have any water or sewer or they have one or the other. And so it makes it really challenging uh, to see economic development growth or mixed use, um, as Alyssa mentioned, having a mix of housing and commercial development in one location. We also do a regional brownfields program. So often if there's a site that needs to be redeveloped, um, one of the first steps is to determine whether or not there are any hazardous materials issues with it. Um, and we have been uh, quite successful in getting Environmental Protection Agency funding to do uh, site assessment grants. We have had some properties in Deerfield, um, but we've worked with uh, 22 towns and on seven sites, over 70 sites. And the pictures are actually of from our smallest town, Monroe. Um, and you can see there on the top picture is a picture of one of their old mills that was actually starting to crumble into the Deerfield River. And it's the location where the whitewater rafting starts. So you can see the whitewater rafters. So it was a very dangerous situation. Um, fortunately, with Brownfields funding, we were able to assess and clean it up um, and then uh, attracted some state resources. You can't really see it, but there's a riverfront park on top of that very large stone wall <laughs> that's holding up the road. Um, anyhow, there's lots of projects around the region um, and you should just keep this in mind if you are thinking about a site um, for commercial uses or mixed uses that uh, Brownfields funding might be needed. And then one of the most, I think, helpful things sort of on a year-to-year -year basis is we are a state data center affiliate. 
And so we can pull uh, data. Um, so if you needed uh, money uh, data for a grant application, you're applying for money for housing or what, or, or what have you, um, uh, Jessica Atwood and some of the other planners can pull that information for you. And so um, Jessica just pulled some data for me about Deerfield, what your current population is. You only have four towns over 5,000. Deerfield's one of them. And some information about um, the demographics and the household income. And actually the census population, apparently we have all the way back to 1790. So I'm gonna stop there. Are there any questions? I see Carolyn's hand up about economic development. Carolyn? Um, yes, I just wanna comment that I, I actually, would really, I was on the seeds board for years and years and years. Um, and I, I think it would be really wonderful if the planning board would want to do some economic development planning and, and do mixed use, propose some mixed use, you know, housing above storefront kind of thing. Cause we really, I mean, all, everything we're doing under the CCI or Con connecting community initiative is trying to revitalize the downtown and having additional housing downtown um, over businesses. And, and of course you can just look at the Cumberland Farms. I mean, at least it's not as ugly as it was, but honestly, we could probably do something with that and it would be lovely. So, um, you know, and I don't know how much, I don't know if it would qualify for Brownsfield because they're supposed to have cleaned everything up, but you know, it would be really nice if we could figure out something for that site because it's right downtown. Even if we only did a little pocket pocket park and then had, you know, some kind of housing and a, a commercial development there, it would be really nice. So, I mean, I think the focus on something like that would really be helpful. Thank you, Carolyn. Other comments? And then if not, Carol, um, Peggy can move forward. <clears throat> No, okay, Peggy. All right, so uh, I'm actually, I'm gonna skip over master plans and open space plans and come back to that and talk a little bit about zoning bylaws because Carolyn was talking about um, mixed use development, you know, um, reviewing your zoning bylaws and making sure that you allow, for example, um, apartments on top of commercial uses, uh, some communities in an effort to redevelop historic properties that may be vacant or underutilized, um, may allow for example, you know, more apartments than you would typically um, allow under just your, your standard um, multifamily definition. And so there's lots of creative ways that you can encourage the redevelopment of those historic structures. Um, and so I know uh, Deerfield has a planned unit development a district that allows for a mix of uses, but there might be some other tweaks that the planning board could look at to see if it could encourage the reuse of some of those uh, properties. The Cumberland Farms, um, presumably the property owner was responsible for cleaning that up and getting it ready. Um, but if you're uncertain about exactly what the status is, the town could request a phase one, which would basically do all the historical research and let you know exactly what's been done. Um, and if there are any restrictions on the property, um, have, have the tanks been removed, for example, things of that nature. So that might be a possibility. We don't have any Brownfields funding right now, but we did just apply and we're hoping that we'll get another grant. Um, usually the wards come out in the spring. So. And with respect to zoning bylaws, one of the other questions was like, what's, what's hot in uh, Franklin County? What are, what are planning boards working on? Uh, solar facilities, a number of communities are tweaking their, their solar facilities bylaws because uh, they may not be uh, particularly um, happy with all the results. Um, there is a requirement to update your floodplain um, bylaws. There's new state, um, regs and, and uh, federal regulations um, in order to participate, participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, you need to uh, look at your bylaw and make sure it meets those new requirements. We've been working with Waitley, so 
Um, that's an area that the planning board might want to think about. And short-term residential rentals um, come up again and again. And uh, that's something I'd be happy to come back and, and talk with the planning board more about. I think there's a number of um, uh, things that communities can do just to make sure that those rentals um, aren't impacting the neighborhood. Uh, some of the key concerns are things like traffic and noise. Um, but there are also concerns that if those properties used to be available for rental units, and now they've been switched to Airbnb, it's also um, potentially impacting your, your affordable housing supply. So trying to balance all that out. Um, and communities, um, a lot of towns have already addressed the legalization of marijuana, but sometimes they may go back and tweak that. So, Having said that, um, back to master plans. Uh, one of the questions was, Deerfield did their master plan in 2000. Should they be updating it? Usually you do master plans every 10 years or so, uh, but they're expensive. And most of our towns don't have funding to do that. Um, but a number of communities, what they've been doing is uh, starting the master planning process, which is usually the first thing you do is community outreach, surveys, threats, community meetings to identify your goals and objectives. And then, you know, as funding becomes available, start working on the different chapters, um, popular chapters or economic development, um, housing. Um, if you've already got an open space and rec plan, uh, that's really a, a very good start for natural resources. Um, so there are ways where communities kind of phase that master planning process. Um, the new state grant program, One Stop, um, that does provide some planning funds and Ashfield and Montague um, got funding under the last round to start up their master planning process. And I see Carolyn's got her hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn. I'm not, I'm not trying to say this is what it used to be, but I just wanna say I was chair of the master plan uh, committee back in the 2000 when we did it, I was on the planning board and um, it sure would be nice to get it updated again. I would love to have the planning board take this on and I realize there isn't funding and that it really is important to have the FERCOG on board, but if we start the process, like if we could just get money for a survey, um, because that's the starting point of all this stuff, as Peggy said, and and that might really be helpful as far as you could have a couple of questions in there about what people truly want in town as well. And that way you're not spinning your wheels and, and you'll have more likelihood of support at town meeting because all these zoning changes require two thirds vote and oh, it doesn't, doesn't take a lot to sink them if the, if the community's not behind it. So um, I would just suggest starting with questionnaires and trying to sort out what the community wants us to focus in on. But I can tell you, I'm still interested in the mixed use housing downtown and commercial de economic development, because I think that if you have a vital community, then you have more chances of having options. And that's really what we wanna do is have some options and make people want to live downtown. You know, it's all about walkability, sociability, that kind of stuff. And I will say I, I did work on the master plan back in 2000, and it was a fun process. Uh, we started, I think, with like 25 folks, and by the end, I think we were up to 70 folks <laughs> that were participating, which was pretty awesome. Um, and people tended to, you know, um, they didn't have to do all the subcommittees. There was a, you know, housing subcommittee, economic development, natural resources, ag. They didn't do all the subcommittees, but they picked out the areas that they were really interested in and, and had it, um, input into developing those different chapters. And then it all had to come back together and, and balance out, make sure that you know, it was consistent um, uh, between the different, um, the different focus areas of the master plan. So um, hopefully if the planning board undertakes that um, process, hopefully uh, folks would come out again and participate. 
I, I just I was trying to be polite and not mention that we've been working together since the last century, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Andrea. <laughs> um, Andrea, you're on mute. I'm wondering about master plan and the whole reason for CCI. Is that something that should be part of CCI? Uh, can I can I um, respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our CCI, Andrea, the reason it's connecting communities initiative is, is coming out of the fact that it, it's no, it, yes, we want, we would eventually want the master plan to reflect what's coming out of the CCI, but the CCI is concentrated for the downtown rather than townwide and it's municipal projects that we want to happen and that need to happen and, and we have a, very, very tight timeline, like mid January to come up with um, an overall plan. And then it's a generational opportunity with infrastructure money and different, you know, I think the money, as far as I can tell, and maybe, maybe Peggy can um, give us some more in information, but as far as I can tell, the infrastructure money is not necessarily going to be new programs. It's coming through older established programs and agencies. So in other words, when we go to renovate the grammar school for say a municipal town offices, you're gonna be able to apply for um, all the green, you know, making it green, making it energy efficient and all that kind of stuff, but not actual renovations. So you're gonna be looking at trying to combine all your pots of money, like your historical preservation funding, your some taxpayer raise money, some um, you know um, energy grants, some you know uh, sustainability grants, whatever. I, you know what we have to be is creative really fast, and that's a little bit different than a master plan, which is more land use based. I don't know. Maybe you can explain it better, Peggy. And my understanding um, also, Peggy, is that master plan um, it's the responsibility of the planning board. Is that correct? Yes, the master plan is the responsibility of the planning board, and typically they invite um, all the other boards in town to get involved. So, you know, having folks from the Conservation Commission, your Ag Commission, Select Board, Finance Committee, you know, if you have a housing group, you know, having all those um, folks involved um, is really important. But typically it is chaired by um, the, the planning board. Thank you. Um, let's let Peggy finish her her presentation and then we can have a few more questions. This has been a really great opportunity for discussion, but we do have a full agenda for other items. So Peggy, why don't you go ahead? So I'll just um, move through these uh, more quickly. Um, subdivision regulations, you um, all know you have a separate um, set of subdivision regulations that govern when there is new um, residential uh, development. Um, that create that um, basically outlines the process for creating a road and lots. Hazard mitigation and municipal vulnerability plans. Um, uh, many of our communities have been working on those, including Deerfield, and those are very important in terms of identifying actions the town needs to take for um, improving their resiliency to climate change. Um, Deerfield has been participating in a variety of watershed plans um, related to the Deerfield River watershed. Something that's newer for us is we um, actually created a regional pollinator plan and we had eight towns um, participate in identifying um, local actions that they could uh, take to improve pollinator habitat. Other land use and natural resource planning that work that we do, we provide green communities technical assistance. So everything from helping towns become green communities um, to um, preparing annual reports or helping them apply for uh, new funds to, for renewable energy or other energy efficiency projects. We do culvert um, inventory and assessment. Um, we have been working on that for Deerfield. We do ADA inventory and transition plans, um, community food assessments. Some communities 
have um, prepared their own um, plans like uh, Wendell um, and Coleraine. Um, other other uh, towns are interested in a more regional approach. And we also help communities with public water supply protection um, plans. So that's our land use and natural resource planning activities, um, just to give you a sense. And I can stop there, or I think I have transportation planning. <laughs> Um, I think as as much as this may or may not um, pertain to responsibilities of the planning board, I mean, in general, it's nice to see the list of things that um, FERCOG could assist us with, but. Yeah, I think um, the transportation planning um, that really uh, comes in um, after you've done your master plan and you've identified areas for redevelopment. Um, that might be in some of the recommendations of your master plan, whether you're pursuing complete streets and getting funding to do some of those improvements to make your downtown more walkable, or you need traffic counting data to um, figure out um, what potential um, impact, for example, a new development might add in terms of traffic generation, things of like that. So these are just other services that um, the planning department can um, provide um, so that you can keep those in mind. Thank you. And the last thing I wanted to go over was there was a question about what does a town planner do? <laughs> um, uh, until recently, only two of our towns had planners, um, Montague and Greenfield. Um, uh, in the last couple of years, Irving now also has an assistant planner and Orange has a community development planner. And this is um, probably something that um, your field might want to consider just given the level of activity um, that the town um, has in terms of folks interested in um, commercial development. So uh, the, the town planner typically uh, is, is um, working on all different types of planning and community development activities. Um, in coordination with the planning board and the select board. They help administer your land use regulations, including um, interpreting and explaining the relevant statutes and regulation bylaws in consultation with the planning board. They provide information to other municipal boards on a wide range of uh, planning and regulatory issues. They do research and analysis and development planning documents. Um, similar to what the Council of Governments planners do. Uh, they work with the planning board to update, maintain the zoning bylaws and subdivision regulations. They look at proposed development plans to ensure compliance with the town zoning bylaws and subdivision regs. They provide the technical assistance to residents or folks that are coming in uh, to apply for example, a special permit or site plan review. Um, they also help out other boards and committee members if they have questions about the zoning bylaws and subdivision rates and overall just helping the application procedures to make sure folks know what they need to do um, and reviewing things and letting them know when uh, their application is complete. They typically work with the planning board to prepare agendas and then a key thing is assisting the planning board or uh, in some cases, it's the ZDA with um, special permit applications and the planning board with site plan review um, and subdivision applications. And then they uh, typically are drafting the permit decisions and making sure that the records are maintained. So very important position, um, really is important support for volunteer planning boards. Um, Peggy, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, I, uh, seems like we've been hearing some uh, discussion recently about whether or not a, a town planner position would also be combined with um, seeking grants and then also grant administration. It seems to me like those are two different skill sets, but could you address that question? Well, I will say that um, many town planners also apply for grants. Um, and administer them. So I'll just use Montague, for example. Walter Ramsey, who's the town planner there, um, not only does 
this variety of uh, activities in support of, of the planning board, but he also applies for grants. Um, and he works um, with a lot of the FERCOG planners, for example, um, he was interested in starting up the master planning process. So I helped him with the scope of work and he applied for the grant and Montague got it, um, but he's gonna you know, administer that grant. Okay. So we often are working very closely with the, the planners in the different communities to assist them to access funding. But having a key person there, which you know, we also work with town administrators to do that, but town administrators often have their plates so full um, that they can take on some grant writing and administration activities, but um, having a planner that's focusing on uh, a planning grant and activities like you know, applying for a master planning grant um, is, is really helpful to the town. Thank you, Peggy. Are there other questions for Peggy? And then we probably should wrap up. <laughs> no? All right. right. Peggy, this has been really helpful. Um, yes. Our next Thank steps you. are going to be probably at our next meeting or so, um, looking at sort of our laundry list. But I think you really, of, of things that we might want to take initiatives with, but having the comments from the community as well as um, your insights have been really helpful so Great. thank you very much and the dlta funding is coming up so if you do want help with zoning revisions that's um a good source of funding remind us um, dlta it's the district local technical assistance and so that notice usually goes out around the end of the year and then you need to coordinate with the select board because the select board needs to prioritize um what sort of their top dlta projects are like board, <laughs> we shall do that. <laughs> All right. So I think it was I think it was culvert inventory, um, but I yes. I, th I think we're wrapping that one up. <laughs> yes, that has been a, a big priority of ours. Listen, yeah. Peggy, thank you. It was so lovely to see you. Be nice to see you. Thanks everyone for having us. Happy holidays. Happy Peggy, holidays. Annalie, can I ask Peggy one quick thing? Oh uh, sure, Jen, go Peggy. for it. Peggy, would you be the person to send if we needed a waiver to be signed about a notification? Would you be the, did you get that today? I did get it and I'm filling it out tomorrow. And are you the person to get it? You'll or... send it back to who sent it to you. That's perfect. I was just okay. double checking. Yes, Thank I'm, you. The, I'm, the, I'm the one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Peggy. All right, care, everybody. Thanks, bye-bye. All right, um, so. Uh, next on our new business is um, Ember Gardens, and I, I made a mistake on our agenda. It's um, Ember Gardens and Sun, Sun's Mass. Sun's Mass is having a change of ownership. And um, there are two things that we need to address tonight. First of all, when there is a change of ownership with something that has received site plan review and whatnot, um, the prior... Um, allow you know prior prior things approvals need to be transferred to the new owners however um it was determined that we don't really have a form for um making trans amending planning board um decisions so we need to address that and then secondly need to set a public hearing to transfer those existing documents to the new owners so first of all as far as the amendment application is concerned um i think you all received a copy of it jen i don't know if you want to give a a, a little bit of background on that where um hold on one second let me get my i mean my understanding is jen's doing that oh uh, that we didn't have a form. <laughs> we have so many forms. One more form we needed, right? <laughs> right. Um, so basically, I was trying to. You you said oh oh that sorry I'm like all over the place. Um, the amendment to that form basically it we didn't have one so we created a form and it's just saying that there you're making an amendment to a current special permit site plan review or stormwater, and you can check it off like the one that's come, you know, that we need to do this for that's coming up actually has all three of those applications. And so you'll just check off all the boxes and say you're resubmitting it with whatever amendments um, is needed. 
So it just formalizes it a little bit that which we sure. never had. So council said, why don't we make one and you and the planning board can adopt this form. Right, so the applicant would actually make an application to transfer those uh, permits and whatnot to right. the new owners. Right. right, okay. Or to make an amendment to the planning board decision. Right. Um, cool, all righty. Such as an owner, it could be other things, but this, this one that's coming up is sure, because sure. of the change of the ownership. Okay. So um, planning board, you did receive a copy of those um, that you didn't receive a copy of that. You did, some did, some didn't, it appears. Um, and so uh, I, ha I could, if you, if you want me to share screen, I can do that. Um, uh, Jen? Yeah, uh, go ahead. So I just, amendment. so down at the bottom, it says share screen. All right. Yep. I just, oopsie. Okay. Share screen. There we go. And here it is. So this is what it looks like. So as Jen said, uh, it's an amendment application for, to amend planning board decisions. And it's pretty straightforward with all of the applicants information, including the name of the plans that that they are requesting be amended and exactly why the action is being requested and then they sign it and then building commissioner takes a look at it and sends it on to us and that's it. Is that right, Jen? Correct. So then it would need to go through whatever process, um, you know, that we usually do um, for those permit applications so then so the building commissioner will sign off of it and then it starts all of the regular processes that we already do um as far as uh you know we check to make sure that it has all the information like if you go up and just stop there for one second whoop go yeah so it says um amend plan so then you know i'd make sure that the plans were the correct plans that are stamped if they were changing something if they're making an amendment to their um, site plan or a special permit plan, um, it would go through those regular processes. Right. Yep. Okay, thank you. So if I could have a motion to approve the amendment application for planning board decisions. Is there a motion? Sure, I so move. This is Andrea. Andrea Leafson moved, and can we have a second? I right, second, Kathy Wetroba. Thank you, Kathy. Um, discussion? I would say for just uh, anything at the bottom if that we just have a, is there usually a date that the day the, the form is approved? Do you usually stick that on the form? Yes, we can put that on the form. <clears throat> okay, great. I'll write that down. Any other discussion? All right, um, so all in favor of the motion to amend, to approve the amendment application for planning board decisions. Um, let's see, uh, Denise. We'll have everybody go off mute for a minute while Denise is going off mute. Denise Mason, yes. Thank you, and Mary? And Mary Cloutier, yes. Thank you, Kathy Wittrobo. Kathy Wittrobo, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson, yes. Kelly Wolfley, yes. So the, the uh, motion passes 600. Zero, zero. Um, and so secondly then, um, there has been a change of, of ownership. Um, I'm not sure if the applicant is present and can speak to this. We will then need to have a motion to set public hearing regarding this, but our, I'll stop my screen share. Are any of the um, related parties present? I don't know. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, Madam Chair, my name is Leslie Delaney Hawkins. I'm counsel for Ember Gardens and with me is Shane Hyde, who is the principal of Ember Gardens. So we are uh, absolutely here and are uh, very excited to move forward with this process. Appreciate all of the help that both the planning board staff and 
especially town administrator Casey Warren ha have given us, we know that this has been um, th this has been a long time coming. So we are here to schedule at your convenience. Oh, okay, thank you, and thank you for um, sitting through our <laughs> the first half of our meeting. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I'm I'm only recently out of municipal government in Boston, so this is a this is a short planning board meeting for me. Oh well, that's great. Okay. So um, I do understand from talking with Jen and whatnot that um, all of the previous um, bylaws that these that that were in effect at the time our um, our approvals were given those are the bylaws that are sort of grandfathered in. So, but what in fact we need to do is have a public hearing for. Um, the site plan review, the site plan, the special permit, and the stormwater management to transfer those um, um, those documents and those plans to the new owners. And so that would be a public hearing that would be set for um, January 3rd, 2022. So if I could have a motion to set the public hearing for January 3rd, 2022 to um transfer the existing decisions regarding site plan review special permit and stormwater management to the new owners so moved kathy sold yes. thank you kathy um can we have a second second andrea thank you andrea um is there any discussion and hopefully that leslie and shane that will be absolutely we will be more than happy to make that work Okay, happy new year. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see, all in favor again with everybody off mute, Denise. Denise Mason, yes. And Mary Cloutier. Sorry, I was on mute. Anne Mary Cloutier, yes. Uh -huh. Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Andrew Liebson. Andrew Liebson, yes. And Lee Wolf, yes. So again, it passes unanimously 600. Zero, zero. Thank you. We will look forward to seeing you early in the agenda, Leslie and Shay, on, uh, on the 3rd of Thank January. You. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Have a great rest of the night. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Fine. Um, old business. Um, Sugarloaf condos, as we recall, there was some discussion at our last meeting that um, there's been a concerns about lack of compliance with stormwater management plan and uncertainty about who has enforcement responsibility and Jen was going to try to research what she could about uh, whether or not there was a bond, uh, you know, mm, what what she could find out about all this. Jen, are you, do you have anything? I've done research and I can't find anything. I've tried to dig up um, the bonds and whether I, I'm it's un unsuccessful. So we're not even this certain. Here. Yeah, we, we're not certain whether or not there was any bond that was collected. I, it says that there was something, but then who holds it, where it is? Yeah. Hmm. What exactly is the issue, Emily? Um, that there, I mean, Bruce could explain also, but it appears that there's a lack that the, um, for the Sugarloaf condos, there was a very comprehensive uh, stormwater management plan that was submitted and approved by the planning board, but it was not, it has not been followed. And there is concern that when the condo construction is finished and the developer turns the properties over to the condo association that the condo association then will be saddled with um, some problems related mm -hmm. to something that the developer was apparently supposed to do at the time that the plan was approved by the planning board. So, um, but it seems to be quite sticky and tricky as it, apparently was there a bond collected to ensure compliance with various aspects of our site plan review, um, who exactly has enforcement responsibility? Is it the planning board? Is it the building commissioner? Is it mm, <laughs> God as she may be? Uh, so um, yeah. 
it's always the problem is who who is enforcing the regulations and the, you know when you have a build out um i mean it's one thing to have building code but like storm water and layout you know and oh all right jennifer would our next step then be i don't know well do we oh, i mean bruce last week um and i see he is still on the this call but um you know, gay has done some very extensive research and has hit brick walls. And I kind of feel if Bruce hits brick walls, then oh my gosh, what do we do? Is that something then Casey checks with Lisa about? I was just going to suggest that that it could be something to say, well, where does the town stand on on that? And does that then go on to the residents to I don't know. I would just, I think I'd need to talk to Casey to see if she would talk to Lisa and see what the best avenue is. Excellent. I think, I believe Bruce, um, I think that sounds like a good plan to get some legal advice on that. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate that. All right. Lily has her hand up. Oh, um, Lily. Yes. I, I just have a question on this. Has anybody talked to the developer? Oh, yes. Okay. I, I figured that was probably the case. You just <laughs> didn't mention it in this conversation. And the developer sa is saying that they are adhering to it or? No. <laughs> I, I think um, Bob talked to the developer. I don't want to speak it for Bob. So okay. I, you could call him and ask him what that conversation was about. Yeah. So, I mean, but I guess the question is um, who has found them to be not in compliance. Well, I mean, there, were, there were certain things that even Bob said, but Bob felt that he, he didn't feel comfortable being the one, like he's not an engineer. Right. You know, so he's, it's, it, there's certain things that, you know, a commissioner has a responsibility to uphold the zoning. He's a zoning enforcement officer. So there's some things that, you know, then he had um, uh, the wetlands, um, engineer come out and they talked about it and some things were changed and he was okay with that but it's those sort of details it's like where does it fall upon the commissioner and where does it fall upon having the money to hire a professional to come out and see if it's been done correctly so that's where the impasse is it's the like bond, it would yeah. come into play mm -hmm. gotcha thank you i appreciate the education sure may, may i speak can certainly I, can that must be bruce yes uh may i speak yes please oh, bruce. okay uh Actually, where the problems near as I can make out is chapter 155 of the town bylaws, which is the bylaws, uh, allows the storm stormwater authority, which is the planning board, to um, delegate in writing an agent. Unfortunately, um, and that goes through um, the construction period as well. Unfortunately, in your stormwater regulations, there is a provision, and there again, it's not for this project only. This is something that needs to be looked on for any stormwater management plan for, uh, in the future as well. There is a provision besides the fees for the planning board to hire an agent for technical and professional uh, uh, guidance if and when uh, they feel that it is necessary. And stormwater management is a very complex issue. And what's been happening out here is some of the guidelines based on the plans have not been followed and the builder is kind of just pushing it off. Well, you know, grass will grow and so forth. But some of the stuff that has not been done would change the uh, calculated flows that were uh, submitted for stormwater management. And it appears that some areas had not been followed in the, the planning board's own rules and regulations as far as um, um, construction inspections and, and things like that. And the other thing is that my question was, is if and when the end comes, um, is there still, is there a bond which was supposedly, supposed by their own regulations and by the stormwater permit, uh, there should have been one put in place uh, and whether some of that had or has been released with the covenants that were signed off for supposedly the road. 
And I can, I've come to a dead end and that's why I asked this. And there again, as I said, this is for this project as well as any future stormwater management uh, decisions that you people make. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah. Well, um, Jennifer, if you can pass that on to Casey and Casey pass it on to Lisa and are we glad that we're not lawyers? <laughs> uh, well, that's exactly where I've come from is I've got to the point where uh, I've re reached my ultimate level in, of incompetence. And, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that, Bruce. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. All right, let's see. Um, on old business also, tur tourism overlay district, as I mentioned last week, we did have some questions that have been raised about possible need for some minor modifications to the tourism overlay district bylaw. Um, sent those questions to the select board and they are, we are awaiting their response. So just keeping you up to date. Annalie, can you share what those questions are? Um, yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Uh, yes, if you hold on for a moment. I usually have a lot of this at my fingertips, but. Um, I'm just curious, and, wh and where were they generated from? Well, the, the, the questions came to me from a number of residents, and then um, uh, since uh, Chris Curtis had worked with us on a number of bylaws, um, I was believing, perhaps erroneously, that that was still under his uh, purview to be able to uh, um, to uh, check it out. Excuse me, I'm looking here, and um, so he he synops he took a look and um, here we go, I think and um, uh, summarized a couple of the questions. Um, there's a question that, um, there are, there's one section that may override another underlying zoning district regulation. Not sure if that was the intent. The buy right uses um, uh, with events, assembly, and hotels is that, that there may be some underlying um, issues related to other parts of zoning bylaws. Um, I can send these. And then um, another section that has confusing language that could be open to misinterpretation. So again, it, like confusing language that could be open to misinterpretation, that's something that um, we've certainly done those sorts of minor modifications in the past um, that would not raise wholesale concerns about the whole tourism overlay district. Certainly that's not an intent at all. I can send these, um, it's, it's a very brief um, summary. I can, send, I can send these to the planning board. That would be helpful. Okay, shall do. Just, Annalisa, sorry, just one other question. Has this been, I, and I can't recall, has this been approved by the Attorney General's office or not yet? This most recent um, I don't believe we've heard back yet from the Attorney General. Um, Jennifer, uh, right? I, um, not okay. in regards not to the October town meeting. Okay. We haven't heard back about the tourism. Okay. Right. The, but okay. so is this, so these are, this is residents and Chris Curtis saying that they want to make these changes to the tourism what we've already no, voted in. Not at all saying they wanted to make changes that there were you know, questions as whether or not some modifications might be um, in, in the best interest of the town before any, other, before any issues arise. That there might be unintended consequences with some of the wording that is in the, um, the bylaws now. So. <clears throat> So you forwarded them to the select board, Annalie? Yes, oh, okay, uh, oh, quite a while ago. Oh. Want me to re-forward? Want me to send them again? Yeah, could you send them to okay. me? 
okay. person, you know, make sure I get him because I'd like to review it. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Do you want me to put it on an agenda, Carolyn? Um, yeah, I think uh, our, our 15th agenda is really busy. Um, how about the 20, um, is it, how about the 29th agenda? Yeah. I mean, I think it, you know, nice, it's, it'll be good to have it addressed. It's not urgent, that's for sure. I mean, yeah. Can you oh. point that to me, please, Annalie? Sure. Yeah, well, we'd want to be able to look at it so that we could fix it by spring if we thought it was a concern. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, great. So I'll send that to the planning board, Carolyn, Jen, and actually the rest of the uh, the select board, Carolyn, just in case it got lost in there. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, we, we haven't had, I mean, I haven't read it, so. Yeah, you had you. a lot of on your board. Um, so we were um, going, talking about doing some updates to our uh planning board policies and procedures and um, with the fee schedules denise and andrea i understand that you've already met with jen and have started to crack that nut uh do you have anything you want to report on well we got some other do you mind if i speak on this behalf denise and andrea? Oh, okay, um, okay so we got fees from other towns and wrote we're making a chart which i will pass around i haven't completed it yet, basically saying what year um, the fees in our surrounding communities were established, what they were, um, what we feel is the most administrative staff, staff time that it takes to complete applications. And then we'll bring it back to have, you know, sort of discussion and see where our fees land in 2022 almost um you know compared to other surrounding communities we were having a difficult time getting some of the fees i should have asked peggy sloan but i'll have sue do that tomorrow um about fur cogs and how what their fee schedules are for planning applications and stormwater applications and such because it seems like there's a couple communities that are a little um like 2010 and i think that they should be updated um a little bit yeah. Right. <laughs> if it's 2010, we're 2011. So <laughs> 2011, aren't we? <laughs> no. 2005 was it? Is it less than that? Oh, oh, ours. Yeah, our fee schedule. 2000. Yeah, as it is 2011, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. um yeah. You, now I'm like, never mind. <laughs> I attended a webinar that did mention, um, as has been mentioned at uh, some of the select board meetings recently, that fees are not meant to make money for the town, but definitely um, we should, towns should um, really realistically um, state what are, what are the, what's the labor, what's the materials that go into uh, processing applications and fees can be made accordingly. Also, one of the other things was that um, fees most likely should be um, to some degree on a on a different scale given different sizes of projects. So um, planning board, <coughs> I'd mentioned to, um, excuse me, to Jennifer and um, I think to Denise about um, that for them to, you know, pull together the information and um, to the degree to which they, they feel comfortable, well, even more so, I mean, for them to then make a recommendation to us rather than for us to be the ones who are um, reviewing all of the data from all the towns and then figuring out what to do. So planning board, are you comfortable with our little subgroup uh, doing that? Um, and then Karen. Kathy saying yes. <laughs> um, Kathy Wetroba also, so the two Kathys, okay. Um, Carolyn, oh yeah, Anne Mary. Thumbs up from Anne Mary, great. Um, Carolyn and then Jen. I, I, I just know. wanted to make a comment that um, uh, as you saw that uh, with Bruce bringing up the um, stormwater, um, interpretation or whatever you guys vote if it's net if you we think that we're going to have a professional or need a professional to evaluate whether something has been installed correctly or is being constructed correctly i think it is important to put in make sure there is some kind of 
um, flexibility to hire a professional that would support the town. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not trying to harp on this, but we have really limited staff. And when you have a big project like this, um, you know, to have the building commissioner re responsible for stormwater implementation is, is, is not really correct because he doesn't have the expertise. Um, and so you really need to have some, an engineer, you'd have to hire an engineer or, or some expert to make sure that they are in fact installing what is required. Right. Well, that, we wouldn't know. Yeah, I may have that sort of a Pandora's box of um, are there special accounts into which um, almost like escrow accounts and fees could be um, deposited and then returned at the end? Well, somebody, somebody's got to be able to figure this. I mean, somebody has a model that works. So I guess, Jen, if you could just go around to towns and see who has a successful model that handles yeah. this kind of stuff. Well, the other thing that is Northampton, somebody like Northampton. Mm -hmm. Jen? Yeah, something that... Um, you know, we'll work and we're working towards that is making sure that our decisions have conditions that are set in a certain way and they're not just um, blanket so that it, it puts that people have to come back to the planning board or there's checks and balances and something that um, I was working on before I left Amherst was in our permitting software. So hopefully at one point, some point we will get that um, it had um checkpoints so you know each phase of a project you had to get through all of these checkpoints in order to even be able to move on and it also linked through your calendar to give you alerts so no matter whose calendar whoever is the administrative staff person would say to the commissioner or to you know um to that project it would flag it to say okay now it's time to you know review x y and z that was in the conditions and and because there are so many conditions that like who's going back and looking at some old conditions that said you have to you know give us a report in 10 years nobody it's right. it's long gone so yeah. whether how we could figure that out in some sort of calendar entry um so that it's a check and balance thing that that um staff is is putting this in and we're getting the alert to content just like with the um the solar Right. Uh, with the although, solar. right. Although it's hard to know how much of that would be related to fees and how much of that would be related to some of our other. Um, yes. Things. But I mean, with yeah. the fees, it's it's also like, OK, so we're going to put that into our, you know, our conditions for major project. We want money set aside that it's going to be put into an escrow account just in case, like you said, and then you get the money back and it has to be interest bearing. And that's something that would then go through Brenda or, who, you know, whoever. But but at least it would be documented and and we would know exactly where it was and it and right. some sort of, you know, so if if planning boards turn over or if staff turns over, it doesn't matter. It's still going to exist somewhere that, right. um, you know, it, it's going to be flagged as something that right. somebody's going to be able to know what it is. And we're not just going to have this wad of money sitting there. Um, you know, don't worry, there's never wads of money sitting. Anywhere. Actually, trust me, there are some. <laughs> there was one that I was trying to figure out because it's we have escrow money and it's just sitting there. And so you have to like, anyway. Okay. Um, that's all right. right. Well, thank um, you, um, Denise and Andrea. So we'll ask for an update at our January meeting and see if you've inched forward a bit on this. That would be helpful. But again, brief updates until we're ready for your recommendation. We don't need to um, look at all your data and help you with the decision. Look, look forward to your recommendation. Um, planning board roles and responsibilities, Jen and I have, um, well, we've pulled together what we think are some source documents. Um, I also attended a webinar that began by saying, what's the planning board roles and responsibilities according to the Mass General Laws? So um, we'll start, start with that and then move forward with um, roles and responsibilities of the, of the uh, officers and see how far we go with that. So. We'll keep you posted on that. Jen? Um, maybe this is a good time because everybody's here. Uh, Anne Mary wasn't here when um, I was mentioning it. Uh, so talk to Casey, talk to Sue, and um, I'd really like to have Sue Berlott 
um, and everybody's in agreement, come to our planning board meetings and she would be taking the minutes and also um, running the meeting so I can be a participant if you need me. And if I don't, if I'm not here, I don't, you know, if you don't need me, then I won't be here um, just because it, there's lots of other things that are going on in the town. Um, and Sue is on board with that. And I think that it would make her job in the office and, you know, run smoothly because she's going to know, she'll know what's going on and not get it secondhand or through minutes. And, and you all will also have the person that's, you know, your, your administrative staff person that you're talking to um, regularly. Um, so if you have questions about where an application is or if some, you know, she'll be right there. And I think that that's going to work really well. And she'll be able to do the minutes in the format that Casey really likes and that has motions and everything the, written out the way that she likes it. Right. And, yeah. Um, Good. Yeah, we'll coordinate now with Rachel in terms of the logistics of clerk and Sue and planning board with the final right. minutes. So thank you. And, and Sue Otherwise, can just, she'll just, um, so just so you know that she's going to flex her time. So then she'll come to those meetings, but leave earlier. Yeah. Um, otherwise, too, um, Sue did send out to us the site plan review, uh, some of the site plan review applications, uh, special permit applications. We also um, have a &R applications, stormwater applications, subdivision application. All of those are very, very old. Um, I think that, um, as a number of you have mentioned to me from looking at, and I believe sending some comments back to Jen, that the documents, the site plan review application, the special permit applications, they're quite dense and really quite um, specific to um, a, lot of, a lot of things that are sort of outside of the general zoning bylaws that we usually look at. And so um, what I'm thinking is, first of all, um, that rather than having you try to review those and send comments back to Jen now, it may make sense for us with all of these policies and procedures that we're updating is that we go sequentially, we don't go simultaneous. So right now we've got the fee schedules happening and the planning board roles and responsibilities. Let's check those off the list and then move forward with one of some of these other applications to update. Um, I think Jen is going, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, it means that we will, uh, well, we may or may not, that, I mean, you know, we're just going to plug away. We're going to plug away at this stuff. Yes, Jen? Something that, that I've been doing, and even as most recently as today, I was um, going over the site plan review application. It's like with somebody and um, having a pre-submittal meeting, I should say, uh, which is really great. And, you know, is making note, okay, this is something that needs to be changed because of new bylaws, or this would be a good add to. And so just marking it up. So I've been making notes along the way, because sometimes you don't even see it, like you're looking at all of it. And it's oh, like, yeah, 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 we need this. And then it's like, good. no, this one, this part needs to change right. of the new bylaws. Great. So, um, if I might just mention because of that, an item unanticipated is that I did do the pre-submittal meeting for the town uh, park project. And it looks pretty much, they're gonna make some changes, but they're gonna be submitting that application. So they, I don't know if you wanna take a vote because we don't know to have that hearing at the next meeting to start it. They would probably greatly appreciate that. Um, it is virtually complete, other than a couple tweaks to it. I mean, I don't know about actually taking a vote on a public hearing when we don't actually have the application. You have to, do you have to take a vote on when it is happening? Because if the application comes in and it's stamped in with the clerks, do you have to have a meeting in order to, I don't know. We're talking about site plan review or the yes. review. Hmm. Um, well, um, we do have the public hearing that we scheduled for January 3rd. One can never anticipate that things will be as we believe, but I, it, it 
seems as if that public hearing would be a very um, uh, non <laughs> non controversial public hearing that we're just transferring the, the ownership. Denise, oh, no, 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 not about that. About the park. You know, it's my understanding that before we do any public hearing, before you know, we're looking at a site plan review that we're actually going and walking. So if this is the park, I you know. I don't really know the whole area of what. Well, what you would have time to do that. I mean, we have to do the publication and everything. So okay. it's not like, you know, it. you're going to have a couple, you know, three weeks anyways. I mean, and you can do a site visit the night, you know, the night before the hearing to, or the day. Yeah, I need to have someone there to show me what it what, what's going to be done. I mean, I could just go there and stand there and I will. Well, I don't have no, no sure. clue. So usually we do site visits the the day of the the hearing, and we can okay. schedule that with the applicants to to you know to go out, which is the town, and you yeah. know <laughs> that would be great. I, I would think too if we're going to um, entertain having the public starting our site plan review public hearing on um, our site plan review on the third, that it could also be contingent upon us receiving the documents for our own review with ample yes. advance notice. And I'm not sure what the ample would mean, but this is going to be a fairly comprehensive project. So we'd want to make sure that we can really begin. Yes, Kathy? I just have a couple comments and um, it's, it's a really busy time of year to be, you know, to be adding something that we're going to be doing January 3rd, but I personally couldn't walk the property on January 3rd because I work. So I would like to be able to attend that. We could also schedule it for the week prior. I'm just saying that it's... Um... But the week prior is is like between Christmas and New Year's. That is just not a good time for me. I mean, I have family coming from out of state and I'm not it's just, it's not possible, <laughs> so. I mean, otherwise I think what we're talking about is that we would start the site plan review at our February meeting, or we would be talking about uh, perhaps scheduling another planning board meeting. Well, honestly, it's when the application comes in and is complete and stamped in, then you have so many days to actually hold the public hearing. So it's really not a matter of whether or not the planning board is, you know, it, there's a time frame that has to happen with- What is that time frame? Um, it has to be, I believe, I don't know. I'm not gonna say, I think it's like four, 30 I days. Almost, I almost think it's 21 days, but I'm 21 not 21 sure. days, yeah, I was like 14 or 30 days. I, I'd have to check, but there is a timeline from the date that it gets stamped in. That's why I've been saying I want a pre-submittal meeting prior to it being stamped in, because I don't want to have a hearing unless I think that the application, Bob and I, I should say, thinks that the application has all of the details. I mean, it is a book like this, and it will be a lot of reading. It doesn't mean that you can't open the hearing and then continue the hearing. Um, if you don't have, it doesn't mean you have to rush through it whatsoever. It just means, you know, you could even have a site visit after you open the hearing. It's just that it would continue. Um, and yes, it is a busy time of year. And yes, we continue to move. We always are moving. We are always open. So um, I don't know. I think, I think the understanding is that it, it will be continued in January. Yes. I don't, I don't yes. think Anyone is and I talked to them about that. I said even yeah. if they if even if they don't have it, even if they do have it and they can't get through it, I can almost guarantee that it's going to be continued. So, um, and I mentioned that to them today. All right. May I may I ask a question? Who, who is submitting the um the this um proposal? So it's the town. It's so the town. yep. So we have um, Jesse who is the engineer. Um, on the project and they have their own council and his name is Jim and he's from uh, something in Donovan and Springfield. Anyways, he, there's a different firm because our council can't also be the council sure. of the applicants. So, yeah. 
Jen, um, do abutters need to be notified prior to opening the hearing? Oh, yes. All of that will go through. We're going to do abutters lists and everything. So we, we did the, and they'll be notified two weeks prior to the hearing. It'll go through every, everything that needs to happen is going to happen. And yeah. Casey sat in on that meeting today um, with Bob and myself, their attorney and Jesse, the engineer. When do you anticipate we will get the, um, the plan? Um, I'm thinking by Wednesday, the latest next Wednesday. Oh, I, I think this Wednesday almost. This Wednesday, well, let me see. We went, we moved backwards, hold on. Not this Wednesday. So it has to be, it needs to be put into the paper. We have to have it no later to the paper. To, so we'll have to have the application stamped in um, by the 15th. It needs to be posted on our website by the 16th. And then it's two weeks. It'll be posted on the 24th and 31st. And then we'll have the hearing on the 3rd. So again, I think, uh, Andrea, wasn't your part of your question is when will we? <laughs> right, right. So when, when we, as soon as we get it, I'll, I'll distribute everything. And so we're, each one of you will get a copy, paper copy of everything, and we'll have a digital copy, and we'll have a large copy that I would recommend that everybody comes into town hall to view. Okay. But because as soon as you receive it. So when uh, would that be? Would it be? Do you I think, think Wednesday, next Wednesday. A week from, so that would give us two weeks, be two weeks between re three weeks. Is it three weeks? Be three weeks. Receiving it and June, January 3rd? Correct. So if we opened the hearing on the 3rd, that doesn't mean we closed the hearing. On correct. The that is correct. Correct. And we would, already, we would have all the materials before that. So we would be able to Definitely. review it before we opened the hearing. Yes. Because that, that is my concern. I don't want to have yes, a hearing will, without us having- You will have all of it. I was very, you know- I, I don't think there's any reason that you aren't going to continue it because it's, it's too, too complicated to do mm -hmm. it in one meeting. Mm -hmm. I think. I mean- that's, Also, that time of year is- Yeah. Right. Yeah. Also, we might anticipate <coughs> comments. <laughs> I'm sure there will be some comments. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, so may I have a motion about um, having the public opening the site plan review for, is it just the site plan review, Jen? Mm -hmm. Is it? Most of it. No special permits, no nothing else it's just um, stormwater stormwater no stormwater and and site plan review so that we would open our public hearing for uh, site plan review and stormwater <laughs> for the is that what we're calling it the park project <laughs> whatever north main street park project yep. we don't have a name for it yet <laughs> that's a that's a donor opportunity <laughs> yes absolutely um so may i have a motion to have the open the public hearing for the site plan review and the stormwater application for the north main street park project we would have that public hearing on january 3rd 2022 jen if we get a complete application. <laughs> uh, yes, well, um, on the condition that we have a complete application that has been, that is available to the planning board by December 15th. Yes. Okay. Okay. So moved. <laughs> that was Andrea. <clears throat> Seconded, Denise. Denise, uh, any further discussion? Um, is there, uh, I mean, not, is it also um, allowing that we, sh we would be able to have a walkthrough with adequate notice for 
Yeah, I don't think you need to vote that. We're going to go on a site visit and we're going to post it. So we'll I'll put out an email of several dates and times that they can do it and, and I'll do a doodle poll or something. for. Sounds all. like we might need something during the week and or on weekends. Yeah, I can figure, I can work that out with that, you know, because it's dark. So we would want to go. Yeah. We can see if they can do that on the weekend. Yeah, that's right. All right, any other discussion? All right, um, so let's see. Um, Denise Mason? <clears throat> Yes. Uh, and Mary Cloutier? And Mary Cloutier, yeah. Kathy Watroba? Yeah. Who is muted? Hello? Yes. Kathy Watroba. <laughs> is it, was that an a, a, a yay or an A? That's a yay. Okay. Kathy Sylvester, thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Andrea Liebson? Andrea Liebson, yes. Emily Wolfley, yes. So the motion carries unanimously. All right. Uh, and Jen, do you have any other business not reasonably anticipated? <laughs> we didn't know that was coming up. Mm -mm. Uh, I can't hear you, Jen. I said, sorry, that just came up today, so. That's okay. Anything else? Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, public comments. Thank you for our members of the public who are still here. I just want to say thank you. I think it was a really useful meeting. And I am really encouraged that you guys are going to volunteer to do some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> hey. it, would really, it would be really nice to have the open space plan. I mean, the, our master plan updated, truthfully. Uh, yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, no other public comments. Great uh, meeting, you guys, or you ladies, or y'all. <laughs> y'all. Great meeting, y'all. Yes, yes, yes. Um, reports from committees sem uh, or seminars. We've got Denise with CCI, Andrea with Open Space Update on the survey. And anyone else? I'm not sure. Yes, Denise? Sure. Okay, CCI, we've had two meetings so far. I think they've gone really well. The, um, the second meeting we had, we were discussing the former grammar school senior center and the church and we determined that they will both stay and as opposed to tearing them down <laughs> and that they'll be renovated and the um our meeting on wednesday night will be discussing the library and then the town hall and the police station and ultimately just trying to come up with you know, a reasonably comprehensive plan that we can take to the MMA, the Mass Municipal Association Conference in January so that we have a plan so that we can go and ask for money, beg for money, right, Carolyn? Yeah, I mean, it, it is an issue and the normal leveraging is like for every dollar we invest, you get three or $4. We are seriously looking at it, six to eight to $9 for every dollar we're investing. So. We need some heavy financing, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm really, really excited about the direction of the committee. I think it's really been going well. And, uh, you know, obviously once we come up with a plan, it's not gonna happen overnight. You know, it, it will be over a period of years, I would at least five years, I'm sure. So we'll look at it, we'll prioritize and we'll take it one piece at a time. So <laughs> I, I think I it's really going well. It's, it's really exciting having, having you know all the different committee members together excellent good thank you for your work on that um andrea with um the survey well i wanted to, uh, two things one is that at the cci meeting um when we were talking about the historic buildings i actually had raised the question of whether we had been in touch with anyone at umass in the architecture school who might have some insight. I do have an appointment with the professor at um, in the architecture school for next week. Denise, if you would help me formulate some questions for him, I would appreciate that. Um, so I wanted you to know that. Um, regarding the open space survey, the response rate is terrible, in my humble opinion. We've got about 100 Responses, the last, um, in 2014, we had nearly 500 responses. So if you can help, 
encourage people to do the darn thing, that would be, that would be helpful. Um, beyond that, oh, beyond that, the Open Space Committee has met again to start talking about its objectives, which will be informed by what the survey says. We are basing things currently, the current um, draft of the objectives has to do with what came up, what was come up with in 2014. And um, I think a lot of we're pulling back on some things because they were uh, very, very ambitious. And uh, let's be a little more realistic. And so, what's the deadline for the survey? December 17th. Okay, and when I went to go fill it out, I somehow I had a hard time finding it on the website. Yes, it's kind of a screw thing. I actually talked to Jen about that. Um, so what happened is that the, um, the town was sent the flyer. The flyer describes the, um, the survey. And at the very bottom of that flyer, it says, if you'd like to take the survey, click here. So you have to go all the way to the bottom of the flyer. Can you change that? Me personally, no. Well, no, and I asked, and I asked Jen, and I don't think so. She said she puts on the website what, or that someone does, what they have been offered, and what got offered was the flyer. Can you offer something different, which is just the website, and a two sentence statement? What we can do is put the link. If you send me the link, it's on that flyer. <laughs> well, yeah, but just separately, send me the link, and then I can put that that link in a header and just says click here to take okay. a survey and no jen would you put it on the um selectman's um agenda to announce the open space survey um i oh geez we, we don't have a meeting until the 15th so um do it for the cci before the cci um ask ask denise to make that announcement before the cci and oh, can I ask, is there, is there some way to talk at the senior center? It's my understanding we can't leave anything there at the church, at the at Holy Family in, in that spot. It, so we do have a pile of uh, paper surveys in town hall and a box to put them in right next to it. But it would be probably very helpful to go to the senior center and say, here, fill this out. But I, so I don't even know how, how so to do it. I'd be willing you, to do, sorry. I was gonna say I'd be willing to be the person to say, here, want to hand these out and here's some pencils and take 10 minutes and do it and I'll take them from you. Yep. So um if you can get me the bunch of flyers, I can give them to Pat to give to Sue Corey or they're they're on the table right inside the door. Um, you just grab those and give them to Sue Corey. Who's Sue Corey? I'm sorry, I don't know who she she's, is. She's been, um, she works with at the senior center and she's been mm -hmm. doing at all, wearing all hats during this time without a director. So maybe, maybe okay. the two of you can figure this yeah, out. Yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk to you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Carolyn, do you still have a question or are you just- Oh, no, no, I just, I didn't know um, where Andrea had the, where the survey was. So they're at, they're at, the, li they're at the library on the bulletin board that people walk by and oh. on the right near the children's entrance door. Um, uh, thank you. And on the table in the town hall. Perfect. Right. Thank you, Andrea. Lily? I have a quick suggestion. Um, we got a phenomenal turnout from parents by being at the Frontier Regional School and handing out information to the parents when we were trying to um, get the park because the parents didn't even know about the special town meeting. And we had so many people turn out for that meeting. And you might recall they all left after the vote, but but um, that would I think it was uh, had a real impact by it was a parents' night that we <laughs> made a point of being there and handing things out. And that seems to be, that and the transfer station uh, seem to be effective ways of reaching people. Okay, okay so Andrea, maybe if the two of you can talk. I'm actually, I'll, I'll take them to the, um, to the COVID uh, clinic. <laughs> Perfect, Andrea. Good, good. I'll grab a handful, because um, I'm there earlier than you. So I will bring a handful over myself. Thank you. 
All right, um, we are a tad over our, um, our oh, sorry. late date, but still um, lo uh, with mail, um, Locust Development has um, is building, as you perhaps saw in the mail, it was a late comer, um, a wireless telecommunications facility in Conway, a portion of that area of potential effect is in Deerfield. Um, and they're seeking comments related to the um, the effect on our historic properties. They want us to state whether or not we have an opinion of interest or no interest. And we have to do that within 30 days of um, November 23rd. So what they are proposing are panel antennas mounted on top of a steel tower. The, everything's gonna be painted brown, I guess. It's 156 feet tall, um, including the base and the top antennas. Um, I checked out the size of building stories. So that's approximately 11 stories, which is uh, the closest I could find is the Springfield Marriott is 15 stories at 183 feet. Um, Bob War Walden, our building commissioner has said he has no comments or concerns. The only potential effect would be seeing the tower. Um, we did get a newly scanned aerial view of the area, and I can put that up if you need. Um, but, you know, we're supposed to just comment on the potential effect on historic properties, and I don't right. know if people... So I drove by there today, uh -huh. and it's about a mile and a quarter past um, Pekarski's. Mm -hmm. It's in a in a heavily wooded area and it's hilly, so I'm not quite sure how we'd see the tower. I did, had no idea it was that tall. That's kind of irritating, but um, and I don't understand what the historic buildings impact for Deerfield would be. It's in the woods in Conway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess this is kind of the Deerfield um, area. I don't know, maybe Kathy would be able to see, Kathy Sylvester could see it from her house. I don't know. I think it's here's, aiming the other direction, but. Here's the approximate site location down here, 15 stories or 30, 11 stories. And, uh, you know, I mean. It's a landscape, I think is what they're talking about. So your landscape is affected, but you, I don't know what view shed it would be in. Uh, if it's come, if it's further up from Bakarsky's, right? Um, I guess it would have are down, down. It's to tw it. toward Conway from Bakarsky's. Up, uh, you know, yeah. it's in Conway. It's not in. It's not in Deerfield. And would it improve our cell service? Well, that's kind of beside the point. I mean, I, I actually wonder also whether or not we have any leverage over any of this. I mean, they, they want to know if we have any opinions as to whether or not we're um, of interest or no interest. I, yeah, oh yes, uh, Denise, sorry, I couldn't see. It, it basically said, does it, will it have any effect on the historic value? Or the, and, and if it doesn't, then it's sort of a moot point. I don't think we should offer any other opinion. I, you know, it's that, I mean, that was the question. And I don't think, I don't think anything else we say is really going to matter because that's not the question they were asking. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and as Bob says, the only potential effect is seeing this however, well, yeah, that's the whole effect. <laughs> well, um, so, uh, well, I would tend to think that if, I mean, as sort of uh, non, um, if somewhat evasive as, as Bob's statement was, if he isn't feeling that there's a problem on the historic properties, mm -hmm. I, I can't say. I mean, I'd almost have to. <laughs> yeah, I think we have no comment. Yeah, I, I, I would think it's better not to comment. Agreed. If you make a comment, I agree. it would be seen as an endorsement or mm -hmm. not. And mm -hmm. if it's not, it does has no impact anyway. So truth. Right. So mm -hmm. I think you're safer to have the ability to hold back mm -hmm. in case there is some comment that you want to make. Just for the uh, heck of it, why don't we um, 
Can I have a motion to make no comment in response to this um, proposal? I make a motion to, to respond no comment to that motion. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sylvester. Yeah. My brain fell Sylvester off. second. Uh, is there any discussion? Um, so let's see. Denise Mason. Yes. And Mary. And Mary Cluter, yes. Kathy Retroba. Kathy Retroba, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson, yes. And we will pull yes, so it passes unanimously. Um, the other mail, um, and I think it's just important, you know, sometimes you can look at these pieces of mail or I can and think, oh, geez, you know, whatever it is, is it? but it really is an opportunity for us to see, such as Furcog was saying this today, you know, what's going on in the other towns. So uh, the, the Greenfield ZBA is looking about uh, converting a farm into a fourth dwelling on a location, also converting a single family home into a two family home. Um, a special permit for constructing a deck off an existing house that changes the setback requirements. And um, they also granted a special permit to allow installation of a solar array on the roof of a carport, but that changed also the setback requirements. So, um, you know, FYI, right? That's what's at least going on in Greenfield and, well, Greenfield right now. All righty. Um, ooh. Next meeting, January 3rd. Um, I haven't heard any specific updates about how the new acoustic equipment or whatever you call it is at town hall. We've been having our meetings remote rather than hybrid or in-person only. Can I have a motion? <laughs> remote, hybrid, or in-person or what, you know, discussion? I think that may, I'm sorry, Denise. I know. I think that may be a, a controversial meeting with the, you know, talking about the park and so these hybrid, we just haven't had good luck with unless we have good equipment and so I would suggest zoom mm -hmm. so everybody can be heard mm -hmm. or yeah. I just Kathy or Denise and then I, I don't then Carolyn Denise. I agree, you know, until we get it together, just do a Zoom. And plus we've got the, um, you know, the marijuana people, I'm sure they're gonna be on Zoom. And if it end, ends up being a messed up hybrid meeting, it's gonna be really annoying. Yeah, yeah. I don't wanna be annoyed. <laughs> Other <laughs> comments? You would not be annoyed, would you? <laughs> oh, I would be annoyed. <laughs> All right, it looks like we have maybe um, consensus about uh, remote. Jen, did you have something to say? I, I would just I would be annoyed if the hybrid didn't work. <laughs> I, I was, was going to say that I think we've sorted out the hybrid, but I'm not 100% sure. But I just wanted to bring up as the Board of Health Chair that yeah. um, you have a new variant mm. that's out there. Mm -hmm. And if it's a controversial meeting, you have people, more people than just your committee. And so it will be more difficult to socially yeah. distance. So my recommendation as the Board of Health is that you have a Zoom meeting too. Only because I think it will be safer for January and February. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> I agree. <laughs> well, once this new variant is taken over the Delta variant, then it seems to be milder. And if you're vaccinated, it's not gonna be a big deal, but so far, but I mean, we don't really know, but until that point, and we have more information, it's probably better just to say Zoom. Right. All right. So it looks like I don't think we need to have a vote. It looks like we're in agreement that we will have that be remote only. Um, a reminder that uh, two people whose names shall be unstated um, still need to give me their preferences for the respectful workplace and in service. Thank you to the other four people who responded. And then also a reminder that the campaign finance reports are due January 3rd, 20th. And with that said, at ooh, 13 minutes past, may we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. I second. <laughs> all right. Since um, Rachel wasn't here, because she always does it first. All in favor, all in favor. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye, everybody. You.